We started with $110 million. We grew that to about four and a half billion dollars at peak. And I'll never forget Steve Schwartzman on the first day I got there, basically sat us down and said, we want equity like returns with bond like volatility and never lose money. And I was just like, well, that's a tall order, sir, but we'll give it our best. The mistake that I see most people make is what I've always advised people to do for their first rental or investment property is to find a place that they really like to go because then you have a connection to it and there's a why associated with it. So for instance, if you and your family really like to go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina and you've been going there for a long period of time, you plan on returning there, then likely going and buying a place in the Outer Banks of North Carolina is something that's gonna keep you interested and engaged and going back and forth because while many people will tell you that it's a passive investment, that's not true. It's actually quite active when the I don't know, the roof collapses, there's a plumbing issue, there's a whatever, and I can share with you from firsthand experience that I bought a really high quality investment property in Brooklyn, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, uh, probably in 1998, uh, believing that there would be more gentrification and that the asset would increase in value. And I was early and I was right, but I couldn't hold it long enough to actually monetize that investment because I never went to Bed-Stuy you know, on my own, I would only go there when it was a chore or a pain in the butt or a problem. And consequently, uh, as humans, when we're doing things that don't really uh, align to our interests or our why, and it's a chore, imagine the last time that you were told to do something you didn't want to do and do it again and do it again. Eventually, you're just like, what am I doing this for? You know, there's not enough money in it and so on. And real estate is a long term appreciation play. So if you find some place like the Outer Banks, for example, that you've been going to for 10 years, and you think you'll continue to go for the next 10 or 20 years, when you go down there and you fix the roof or you meet with the contractor, you go to your favorite restaurant, you go for a surf, you do whatever, and it's not that bad. So the first thing I would share is try and align it with something that's meaningful to you, that uh, you enjoy doing, that connects to your why and your purpose, because then all of these problems are little speed bumps along the journey and they don't derail you. If you do something just purely for the math and the numbers and like you, you crunched all the numbers, you think it's gonna be a home run and there's a little speed bump and another little speed bump and another little speed bump. Very few people have the lasting power and the grit and determination to just stay at it long enough. And what I like to share with people, especially if they're not, haven't done this before is when you go and buy a real, a piece of real estate, you're generally getting a 30 year mortgage. There's a reason that it's a 30 year mortgage. You want to hold it for as many of those 30 years as possible so that you have as much possibility and opportunity for price appreciation. If you did it for 30 minutes, it's not going to do anything. You do it for 30 days, it's not going to do anything. 30 weeks, not going to do anything. So you really have to have the lasting power. And so that's the first thing I would ask is why do you want to make money doing this and where do you want to do it and align it to your why. Now, if it's purely a quantitative thing and you're indifferent between buying uh, a rental property and a stock or crypto or any of these other asset classes, um, I would start with a macro view of the world and try and understand where there's more uh, demand for housing or vacation rentals than there is supply. I would look for capacity constraints, like why is there not gonna be sprawl? So I love investing in valleys. We're sitting here in Jackson Hole, it's highly regulated. It's a small little uh, valley. 99% of the land around here is preserved in perpetuity as national forest, it'll never be built. So what you're looking at is a very scarce resource. 1% is buildable and 99% of that is already built. So in all, in all like mathematical, supply and demand equations, as long as there's continues to be demand and people want to come to Jackson Hole and people want to hold their real estate, then prices will likely rise over time. So I would start with a macro view of the world. I would look at places that have scarcity value as opposed to sprawl. And I would buy something um, in the best location I possibly could and monetize it as quickly as possible and hold it for as long as possible. Everything I do starts with a macroeconomic perspective. I start with a top-down view of the world and then I find a asset at the bottom. And so I express my top-down view of the world with this asset. So let me give you an example. When we went down to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, um, and we're now the largest landowner on Hatteras Island. We didn't intend to be the largest landowner. It just sort of happened because as we became familiar with it, we saw more and more opportunity. We bought more and more and we were in the right place at the right time and we had high conviction. And the reason we had high conviction was it turns out that the 
only way you can get to Hatteras Island is one bridge. In 1963, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a bridge. They guaranteed it for 30 years. So by 1993, it was no longer being maintained and eventually fell into ruin. And it was actually rated you know, as one of the least safe bridges in America at one point in time. And when I got down there in 2017, I came over this dilapidated bridge, but I could see just to the side was a new bridge going up. And that new bridge was the state of North Carolina investing um, about $1.5 billion in multiple bridges and in infrastructure and changing stuff. And the reason is because North Carolina's largest source of revenue is vacation and tourism tax dollars. So this is the macro, right? I'm looking at why are they spending this much money? How are we going to have safe passage? And this new bridge was completed, I think, in 2018 or 2019. It's guaranteed for 100 years. They do quarterly seismic testing. And so like the safe passage is now guaranteed for 100 years, far longer than my investment in my life. Uh, but what that allowed me to do is start to take a look at the real estate and say, this area is depressed. So I was buying it on pennies on the dollar, right? right? Relative to the highs, I was literally picking up uh, for pennies on the dollar. And the reason is supply and demand again. So there's reasons that people have to sell real estate. Death, divorce, taxes, kids move out, loss of job. When these things happen, you sell your vacation home, unfortunately. Now, there's no reason that people have to buy in any one location. There's lots of beaches and lots of vacation communities. So if you can't get there safely, chances are you're going to say, I'm not going to buy in that location. I'll buy, you know, just north or just south. So more sellers than buyers, the prices just fell. So literally from, I don't know, 2003, 2007, I think was the peak. Uh, so yeah, 2008 prices started to fall. When I got there in 2017, after nine years of straight knife falling, very few people have the confidence, conviction, or courage to catch that falling knife. And so prices just kept going. And so I just started buying one lot and then a second one and then a third and then a fourth. Uh, my girlfriend at the time was like, why are you buying all this land? Like just build a house and call it quits. What are you doing? But I just saw incredible value and this brand new billion and a half dollar of infrastructure. And my bet was a pretty simple bet. Um, Hatteras Island and the Outer Banks are the nation's largest national seashore. Absolutely gorgeous, filled with kiting and surfing and bird watching and fishing. And I mean, it's just absolutely remarkable. And my belief was that once it had safe passage onto Hatteras Island, that prices would increase in value. And you could just take a look at the communities to the north, like Duck and Kerala. They were trading at a multiple of Hatteras Island. So Hatteras Island was on sale. And in most instances, when people see something that they want, you know, Manoa, you've got camera gear, it's on sale. You buy more, right? You don't buy less. Um, but in real estate and these bigger transactions, people get scared and frightened and nobody wants to catch that falling knife. And so I just started buying and accumulating. And uh, before you know it, we literally put in the bottom. If you just look at the price of appreciation of Hatteras Island. And when we started buying, you'll see it went straight down. It flattened, which is when we were accumulating. We kept buying, kept buying, kept buying. And the prices just started going up and they haven't stopped. We own approximately 60 acres in the aggregate of um, mostly land. A lot of it's uh, sound front, which I also have another macro case study to share with you about that. So uh, when we have these ideas, we sanity check them, right? It's, gut, intuition, and then we apply normal supply and demand and macroeconomics uh, to confirm our intuition is right. But again, we start with the intuition and then we confirm it, which is very different than the way many people invest where they start with the number crunching and then they never develop the gut. And so it's just the numbers. You make one error in the formula, you're kind of hosed, right? Um, so what we did was we took a look at other places that have become very popular for kiteboarding. And the example that I will give is the Turks and Caicos in the Caribbean, a great kiting spot, but it wasn't always a great kiting spot. What it was previously was a great vacation spot, a resort, a beach spot, a Caribbean spot that people would go down and lay on the beach. And so consequently, the most prime real estate on the Turks and Caicos Island was oceanfront. That's why people went down there. It has an incredible bay which is where the kiters go. And for years, decades, they couldn't give away the bayfront land because nobody wanted to be on the bay. Everyone wanted to be on the ocean. So it traded at a massive discount, maybe 10 cents on the dollar. So you could buy all this bayfront land for very, very inexpensive. And it was really interesting to the kiters because that's where they go kiting. And so if you'd start taking a look at what happened when the kiters landed, which is, by the way, the fastest growing sport on the water, 
uh, they started buying and buying and buying. And again, now there's demand. So prices go up, go up, go up. And now it's almost one to one. So there's an equal number of people who want the ocean, non-kiters, as people that want the bay because they're kiters. And so the land that was once completely on sale is now trading almost at parity to the ocean front. And so the bet in uh, the Outer Banks that we did was there was always a bid for the ocean front. Everybody wanted the ocean front. Kiting came along, became very popular on Hatteras Island and in the tri villages in particular, which is where we have our 60 acres. And so our bet was similar, which is the same pattern that we witnessed and observed in the Turks and Caicos, where kiters would drive the demand on the bay front or the sound front in um, the Outer Banks is exactly what we believe to be happening. And we're seeing that now. In fact, we just had a record-breaking uh, sale, almost $2 million for a parcel of land on the Bayfront when I was picking it up in the you know, low $100,000 range initially. The first parcels of land versus where they're uh, currently valued now, we've probably seen between a four and six X return in about five years. And um, we're not done. I still think that there's a lot more room for that. Uh, the other thing I would share with you is we've actually exited, so we've tested that theory, non-relevant, uh, non-strategic parcels of land. Because again, I was just like buying everything. So as we started to refine our business plan, we understood what it was that we were going to be making. Um, we went out and sold non-strategic parcels of land. And so these aren't just theoretical marks. These are actual transactions. And I think on average, we exited between 2 and 4x. Um, on the non-strategic, non-core parcels. Over time, you need to develop that gut instinct. You need to know intuitively what you're looking for and have your own set of experiences. And so very quickly, back of the envelope, you just know. But that takes time and practice and experience. And uh, what I fear is too often we see junior people that start from an opposite perspective. They're just literally crunching numbers on a spreadsheet. They don't exactly understand what those numbers mean or how to translate that. And so they become dependent on the spreadsheet and they never develop that instinct. Uh, some of the things that go into it, again, uh, I firmly believe in everything that we do at Stomp and all the different businesses I've ever started, it starts with me. If it appeals to me, if I like it, if it's meaningful, then it's a pretty straightforward bet that there's someone else on the planet that this would appeal to too. So what I don't do is go and find things that are terrible in terrible locations and bet that I can like turn it all around. Um, I often will find properties that have tons of potential that haven't been maintained, but the location is great, for instance. So like these are value add strategies where you can actually create your return. If you can go find a great location and the asset hasn't been maintained properly or is in need of a total gut renovation or many times uh, my preferred method is actually to take things down, just like, you know, demolish it and start all over. But that's a more advanced strategy and I wouldn't recommend somebody do that. But now you're starting to take a look at not what is, but what could be. When I graduated college, I um, decided to take a year off. I skipped a grade, so I was early. I graduated just having turned 21. My girlfriend at the time, who later became my wife and is now my ex-wife, was going to take a year off before going to medical school. And so I was kind of like, well, you know, a year's do me, so I'm gonna just go. And I traveled Europe for a period of time for four months, and then I came back and I moved to Crested Butte, Colorado, where she was, and we waited tables and skied all day. I got over 100 days of skiing, and it was an incredible year, and, you know, really, really glad I did it because, you know, it's hard to do now. But at the time, it seemed kind of controversial and filled with risk and don't become a ski bum. But um, we went and we did it. It was absolutely fabulous. And then after that, I went and worked uh, on the floors of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade and became a trader, uh, started to manage my own risk. Somebody backed me, which, you know, I can't believe that they did with such little experience, but they saw something and I became the first or the fastest from clerk to trader in this firm's history within almost, I think, three, four months, I started trading their risk capital. And um, I really enjoyed that, had a wonderful time, but the physicality of being in the pits and just sort of the flow of um, the transactions, a lot of it is just momentum and flow, really um, didn't work for me. I wanted it to be a little bit more cerebral and thoughtful. Uh, so I applied to business school and was fortunate to get into the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania, where we where I became a finance major. And the first year, between first year and second year, I was recruited by a firm called Swiss Bank in the Swiss Bank O'Connor Group. The O'Connor Group were some of the most um, successful and profitable 
options traders at the Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade and so on. So when they saw my background, that was the natural fit. And ultimately, I worked that summer in the Swiss Bank O'Connor Group doing uh, exotic derivatives, which, as you can tell, were quite exotic and out there and pricing all sorts of things. And I actually got a full-time offer upon graduation to return to the group. But uh, I was fortunate enough to be recruited by the Blackstone Group into a newly developed group called BAM, Blackstone Alternative Asset Management, which was um, an idea of Steve Schwartzman and Pete Peterson, the founders of the Blackstone Group. And what they wanted to do was take $1.1 billion of their capital and have it invested in non-correlated, non-directional strategies so that basically price always went up and you never lost money. And that's kind of the holy grail of investing. It's much easier said than done, but uh, that was the mission that we were charged with. And I was the only uh, associate hired that year, the first associate into the group. And I'll never forget Steve Schwartzman on the first day I got there, basically sat us down and said, it's a billion one of my money and my partner's money and a couple of friends and family. And here's what you're going to do. We want equity like returns with bond like volatility and never lose money. And I was just like, well, that's a tall order, sir, but we'll give it our best. And we actually did. That went on to become, I think it's one of the largest alternative groups right now. I think they're running almost $100 billion. Um, but our mission specifically was to invest in the world's top hedge fund managers that had unique edge and alpha uh, creating capabilities that were both repeatable and sustainable. So we would invest in, um, I mean, over the course of my investing career in these hedge funds, we invested in such legends as... Uh, Richard Perry and Carl Icahn and Vinick and uh, you know Paul Tudor Jones and Bill Ackman and um, you just you name any hedge fund manager that uh, was at the peak of their game in like 1998 to 2008 and we met them knew them uh, maybe invested in them and so they would do the actual underlying security analysis and find the deals and opportunities but what we would do is create a portfolio of the best of the best and weigh it properly so that it would engineer, financial engineer, the return stream and the risk profile that we wanted. What we actually cared about much more than returns was risk and specifically risk adjusted returns or what's known as the sharp ratio. We really care for every unit of risk that I'm taking, what is my return? Because it's really easy to go to the casino and put it all on say uh, a number on the roulette wheel, it's 35 to one. Now, if you win, you get really lucky, the odds are against you, you seem like a hero, you got a massive return, but you were literally willing to risk 100 cents of the dollar on a loss 34 out of 35 times or whatever number of you know things are on the roulette wheel. So in our particular case, what we were trying to do was find uh, up and coming managers that had unique business models that could generate this alpha for us, and then we would weigh them um, by a variety of factors, their risk, uh, their geography, their asset class. And what we would literally do is sit down once a quarter and predict what each asset class would do in terms of returns and what each asset class would do in terms of risk, calculate that weighted risk adjusted return, and then create this portfolio that um, created this steady stream of returns. And um, I worked there for a couple of years before being recruited to another firm called Ramius Capital Group, which was uh, founded by Peter Cohen, ex-chairman and CEO of Shearson Lehman Brothers. My direct boss was Tom Strauss, ex-president of Solomon Brothers, and it was much smaller. I was the fourth employee in this group. Um, we started with $110 million of uh, founders capital, same mission. And over the next eight years, we grew that to about four and a half billion dollars at peak before I was actually let go after the great recession in 2008. The mistake that I see most people make is assume that because something's worked in the past, it'll continue to work in the future. And so by way of example, I've been very negative on uh, the multifamily asset class for, oh, probably a decade or so. And um, I missed a massive run up, right? For the last, you know, seven of those 10 years, it was a really incredible asset class. And what happened was uh, we follow the fund flow. So everybody thought it was an incredible asset class. Lots of money flew into the space. It's kind of like a hot potato. I bought it for one, I sell it to you for two, you sell it back to me at three, we sell it to this person for four. And so prices keep going up. And so people start to get attracted. They're like, oh, wow, this is a great asset class and it'll never stop. And for me, that's the biggest mistake because I know the music stops. It's working, it's what's working now. It doesn't mean it's what's working in the future. And so I take a look at the risk and as I see a lot of 
novices and neophyte investors putting massive amounts of money and accepting in return a lower return, right? So what we saw was cap rate compression. And I'm saying to myself, you're risking $10 million buying this building for a three cap or three and a half cap. That's insane. Like it doesn't make any sense in the world. In fact, all you need is one hiccup and this whole thing is going to unwind. And now all of a sudden, all those people that bought at the top are going to run for the door at the same time. And there's no natural buyer because it's so overinflated. So what you see is a step down. It goes from here and it's quick. It's sudden risk happens quick. So it's gradual on the way up, but then on the way down gap. And so what we're seeing now in the last two years in the multifamily space is exactly what worried me and exactly what I was um, predicting would happen. And so the average person was focused on the return and not the risk. I focus on the risk first because compounding requires you not to lose capital. And that's why Steve Schwartzman and Pete Peterson and Tom Strauss and Peter Cohen and all the really smart investors say never lose money because it takes, you know, if you lose 50%, you have to make 100% to get back to even. So if you never lose money, you just keep positively compounding and um, compounding, as many people know, is the eighth wonder of the world. So you can't lose money and you just have to focus on the risk. The pendulum swings too far in both directions. So I just shared with you how multifamily got really overpriced because everybody got very, very excited about it. It's the same thing on the way down. So when something's completely out of favor, you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, there's a place where it's too cheap. And we shared a little earlier about the land that we bought in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. If I could buy national seashore on the water that's absolutely gorgeous for 10 cents versus the 2007 high, I'll buy that all day long. And the reason isn't because I'm certain it's going up, but I'm certain I can only lose 10 cents on the dollar. Right? It'll never go below that. So um, for me, when I take a look at the risk rewards, what I'm looking for is an asymmetric bet. I want to risk as little money as possible for as much upside as possible. And it doesn't matter if I lose money on trade A as long as I make a killing on B. It's okay to get a little hurt on trade C because trade D does really well. And so even though uh, we don't like to lose money on anything, it's just that mindset that says, well, I know what my downside is and the upside is infinite. And so um, you didn't really ask this question directly, but I think it answers some of the questions that you're asking. Leverage slices both ways. It can really emphasize your return to the upside. And so I'm an advocate of leverage during the right time, the right season, the right asset class, the right rates. Um, the flip side of that is a lot of people use uh, leverage, whether it's margin and stocks or um, mortgages on real estate, floating rate debt, for instance, it can be deadly. It can take you out. And so um, we start with risk management and then we focus on risk adjusted returns. We look for these asymmetric bets and you don't need to be right 100% of the time, but you need to let your winners run. So the people that I know that have managed uh, very sizable portfolios and have done extraordinarily well have a very strong conviction about uh, their outlook but they don't get married to their positions. You have to have that risk management. So no matter how right you think you are, you have to be able to stop yourself out or charge your risk manager with stopping you out so that you don't get taken out and like lose it all. Um, and that's a mistake that I see. Even some of the most successful managers in the world will often get married to their position and lose so much money that they can never come back or make it back. So some of the things that um, I like to see is discipline and risk management, uh, stop losses and things like that. Life can be chaotic and there's a lot of things happening. And that's what I learned on the trading floor at the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange. Everyone's flashing their numbers and signals and it's screaming and the colors on the jackets are all really bright and it's just absolute insanity, right? And yet, there's millions or tens of millions of dollars on the line. And when I needed to make a decision, mathematically, it had to be right, right? So you have to be able to be calm and focused amidst all this chaos or in what we called fast markets on unemployment day when the data was coming out. The markets are all over the place, which is volatility is your friend in those instances, right? Because if you think about a very steady market, how much money can you make? But when something is going like this, even though it ends here, but all that volatility to get there, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. You make a fortune getting to the same place. But in order to do that, you have to stay calm. Now, we will all be super calm and collected on this steady path, right? But the really good money managers are calm in this volatility and they're taking advantage of it. 
and the way that we used to invest was I was co-head of investments, which means I had conviction, um, a strong personality, um, confidence, and would make big, bold uh, investment decisions. We were running four and a half billion dollars. So a lot of people say to me, how could you sleep at night and how could you do this? And my gosh, I couldn't. But the reality of it is, it's like anything else. You start gradually. I didn't start at four and a half billion dollars. And then the numbers aren't really meaningful. And we would make day one investments of a hundred million dollars or more. So you have to have that confidence and conviction. The downside of that is you often will have blind spots and you need somebody there to help so that you don't get um, taken out, right? Like going to zero is not a good thing. So um, we would hire the best risk managers who would monitor on a quantitative basis our drawdowns. How much have we lost? And they would have the ability um, to literally stop me out of a position. So no matter how high my conviction was, I gave them the authority to save my ass. Mm. And we did that in a variety of things. So um, even though I was co-head of investments, we had people that had veto power over my investments general counsel, if there was something in the documents that they couldn't live with, we wouldn't make the investment. The operational due diligence team, if there was a reason that the business wasn't being run properly or the marks weren't right or there was something that was uh, concerning, um, they could stop me out. Risk manager could stop me out, et cetera. And so the point is, even though uh, I had the title of co-head investments, I surrounded myself with a series of experts that I trusted and that had a very specific purpose and it was to save me and others from my blind spot or my confidence or my conviction. And that's very rare. Most people don't surround themselves with people that um, can go against them. They want a bunch of followers. And I wanted the exact opposite. I viewed them as uh, a team who had a very important mission and contribution. And their primary responsibility was to keep us alive, to invest another day. I think very often people will hire people that they like or that they admire for a reason or they want to be like or liked by. And so a lot of that gut and intuition, it's very natural for humans to want to surround themselves with other humans that they want to be around or like, or they'll take a look at their resume and say, oh, well, they did this um, at that shop. They'll come over here and do it for us. And I think that the mistake that you're making is that that shop has an inherent set of skills and talents and reputation and ability. And so by way of example, when we would fund uh, managers at a very early stage, oftentimes they'd be leaving an investment bank like Goldman Sachs, where they had an incredible book, an incredible record. And so you would say like, wow, this person's a real winner and not to detract from them. Of course, they've had an incredible track record. They are a real winner. But how much of that was that individual and how much of that was working at Goldman Sachs where they see deal flow, they get the first call, they have a huge balance sheet that they can use, um, they've got risk management, they've got infrastructure. And what you start to see often was when people would go out on their own and you would maybe hire them or not, now all of a sudden they have to deal with all sorts of things like they have to deal with lease negotiations, they have to deal with utilities, they have to set up with IT, they have to do all this stuff that they never had to do before at your startup or at your firm. And so it's a mistake to just say, well, look what they accomplished at this big institution where everything was set up for them versus coming into this like scrappy startup. Maybe they don't have the grit. Maybe they don't have the resourcefulness. Maybe they don't have the roll up your sleeves attitude. Maybe they want everything done for them and they just want to focus on their core expertise, which might be analysis or investing. And so I think the mistake that many people will say is, or the mistake that many people will make is assume that your firm has all the strengths and capabilities that this other firm that they left has. When in reality, you have none of that and the individual that you are hiring to come over here may not have any of the abilities to build that either and that's really what you need. Most people avoid risk. We are risk averse. We wanna minimize risk, we don't take risk. Um, we want consistency, we want certainty, we want just the upside and, and we're very patient. We'll take however long, we'll just grind it out and life will just be this grind. Um, I have a very different take on that. Because most people avoid risk, I know for a fact that there's opportunities by taking risk. So using Warren Buffett and Geico Insurance as an example so that everybody understands what I'm talking about. Insuring your car is very risky. Right? It's binary, like Manoa got into an accident or he didn't get into an accident. So I either made money or if he got into an accident, I lost a lot of money. 
But Warren Buffett and Geico and insurance companies, what they do is create, a, again, a diversified portfolio. So it's Manoa and his girlfriend and his mother and his father and so on. And so you create this basket of risk and then you price it properly so that you make money over the vast majority of periods. And so that's an example of how you embrace risk intelligently, price it accordingly, and generate outsized returns where most people would say, I would never insure your car. Like, you're gonna pay me $2,000 a year to insure my $50,000 car? No, thank you. But the money is to be made in embracing that risk and taking it on. So um, what I would say for anybody who's listening who's a, a trader, I love being long volatility, right? I don't like to be short volatility, I like to be long volatility. And what that basically means is I just want this because I can value that steady stream and I can sell the highs and buy the lows. 